I'm Freddie McConnell, a journalist and father of two. What are you coming to say hello? Over the past decade, I've seen trans visibility explode in the UK. But in the last five years, it's been mostly for the worse. We are telling boys that they are literally girls if they identify as girls. The so-called trans debate overlooks the fact that trans people are just ordinary people, living ordinary lives, having ordinary desires. There's a culture shift of queer people making babies and making families that we didn't have before. But when the social, medical and legal odds are all stacked against us, how are trans people having babies? Don't assume that you are going to be recognised in your lived gender. This all seems a little bit surreal, little tiny bits of clothing. Amazing. This is Transnational. Some pictures of you and me, the young mum. Great haircut. <laughs> From the moment I came out as trans, the journey to starting a family is one that my parents and I have been on together, and it hasn't been straightforward. I remember vividly when you told me you were trans and yeah. sitting on the bed together, yeah. being quite a you know a moment in our lives together. But one of the thoughts that did immediately run through my head was, oh, I won't be a grandmother for Freddie. That was my immediate assumption and I felt sad about it. As a trans person, I was told for years that if I wanted to receive gender-affirming healthcare, it might mean never having a family and definitely not having biological children. But in 2017, I became pregnant with my first child and I decided to share the experience in a film called Seahorse to help other trans men realize they have this option too. With seahorses, it's the male who gets pregnant and gives birth. It's an affectionate term that we use to describe a transmasculine person who decides to go through pregnancy. Do you want an omelet? Omelet. Anything else? Pancake. Pancake. <laughs> <laughs> Since then, I've been writing a column about life as a dad, hoping to make other trans parents feel a little less alone. Home life with my two kids is pretty normal, except for one big thing. My children don't have birth certificates. That's because I'm in the middle of a court case fighting to be registered accurately as their father or parent. Currently, trans parents of all kinds have to be misgendered on their children's birth certificates because we are not legally recognized under UK law. The current way in which you can identify on a birth certificate is one might argue, discriminatory. Hannah Markham is a senior lawyer specialising in family law. She's been fighting my case since 2018 and is an expert in UK trans parental rights, or rather, the lack thereof. Under current law, you can't have two fathers, mm -hmm. you can't have mother and mother, and you can't have parent and parent, which a lot of the other countries in Europe are starting to do. If you give birth, if you are a gestational parent, you can only be known as mother. Don't assume that you are going to be recognised in your lived gender and lived reality. Because at the moment, under the current interpretation of parenthood, under the Gender Recognition Act, you are not recognised in your lived reality. It doesn't make sense. But the minute you get to this big brick wall, you're stuck by it. The Gender Recognition Act was written almost 20 years ago and made it possible to change your legal gender. But this was back when legal recognition was all about blending in with cisgender people. The Act says very little about parenthood. And what it does say isn't very useful. It seems like no one seriously considered that trans people might become parents after transitioning. Head southwest, then turn left onto. 
All of these legal hurdles leave trans people with few options other than to hope for the best when it comes to having kids. Hello. Hi. I've come to meet a couple who are doing just that. Tea, coffee, what can we get you? Oh, tea. Yeah, this, this all seems a little bit surreal, like a bag of yeah. little oh. tiny bits of clothing. <laughs> So small. <laughs> it's hard to imagine a baby being small enough for the for the yeah, newborn yes. stuff, isn't it? Also, yeah, I don't want it any is. bigger. No, sure. <laughs> <laughs> did you both always know that you did want to have kids one day? You did, didn't you? I think. I think. But, yeah. I think I probably always saw myself with a family. Mm. Never ever saw myself actually being pregnant and having my own kids. Probably never saw having genetic children as something that was on the cards at all. What changed? Like what? What sort of um, showed you? A, transitioning and becoming much more comfortable in myself. B, being in a sort of long-term good relationship. And I guess visibility of people like yourselves showing other options out there. Is this something you've come across where people are surprised that... I think I know what you're... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Chris, <laughs> yes. you're pregnant and Katie's not. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, so that's one of the things that your midwife kind of initially asked. That's probably one of the things I find hard is... Not, not even necessarily other people are asking it, but I feel like I need to justify yes. our choices long term. It would be lovely if we could have children that are genetically rated to both of us. Did you ever think that testosterone meant that you couldn't have kids anymore? Yeah, I'm pretty sure they probably did ask about if I was interested in egg freezing at the time. Presumably on the presumption that I, they wouldn't be any good later on. Mm. Because we're not married. Um, and we didn't go for a fertility clinic, Katie won't be able to be named on the birth certificate. Mm -hmm. So we'll have to go through step-parent adoption and Katie will be an adopted parent. So not only do you guys have to face the prospect of, you know, Katie not going on the birth certificate, but mm -hmm. under the current law, yeah. people like us have to register as mother. Yeah. yeah. How does that make you feel, I suppose? I guess I'm resigned to it, because I know that's the current situation. It's not, not what I would like to happen. So my preference would probably be parent. Despite huge obstacles, trans people are finding ways to have kids. Community members share knowledge and help each other out when our legal and medical systems can't or maybe won't. So I've come to the Modern Family Show, which is kind of a groundbreaking event for LGBTQI plus people to learn about their options for making a family. There's a culture shift of queer people making babies and making families that we didn't have before. There was a sense of shame or that you don't get to have that because you're trans or because you're queer. And as we have this culture shift, more and more people and, uh, are realizing that they can have families and family build in all the different ways. It feels really important to me to be fighting misinformation and trying to be as accessible as possible in letting people know what's okay and what's not. The show is in its second year and is a kind of expo for all LGBTQ plus people, including a growing number of trans people, to see what method of starting a family works for them. They can also hear from parents like trans educator Tristan Reese about the journey ahead. But so you're never really alone, which is great news, because I'm so sorry to tell you, but there are a lot of barriers to family building when you're LGBTQ. Oh, hey. <laughs> hey. How are you? Good. It's really interesting to hear you that in 2002 was when you were being misinformed about your fertility options. I had the exact same experience 10 years later in 2012. That's what I was told by my NHS consultant. And I actually don't know really what people are told today in 2022 same in thing. NHS. Same thing. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I get, really I get DMs on social media all the time from young trans folks, but also older, mm -hmm. saying, I've just started hormones. My doctor told me it would make me infertile. Mm -hmm. How is that possible? And I'm like, it's not. Right. <laughs> and it's not in alignment with the World Trans Health Organization's guidelines yeah. on counseling, fertility counseling for trans people. LGBTQ folks do see building a family as part of their future. And so that's why I do a lot of the professional work I do is because I have to tell like the adoption clinics and centers and social workers, the sperm banks, the egg banks, everything. I gotta say like, you have to get ready for us because we are coming. Part of being queer has always meant building your own family, mm. or like finding your own family, because a lot of us were rejected by our families. Yeah, so maybe people are used to being resourceful and 
quite forceful, I suppose, in what they want to do. Thank you. Cheers, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. In recent years, a moral panic over trans people has gripped the UK. We are telling boys that they are literally girls if they identify as girls. NHS apparently are asking men if they are, could be pregnant before they have a scan that could be a danger to their unborn baby, when the British Cycling have said that they will accept participants in the gender they present, not their biology, biological sex, and a, a pub has decided to end the ploughman's lunch and replace it with a plough person's lunch. How far do trans rights override women's rights. I'm not hostile to trans. I'm definitely hostile to the politics of trans, which seeks to silence women's voices. They are not women. Elsewhere in the world, it's right-wing extremists who are focused on erasing trans rights. But in the UK, transphobia is as much of a problem on the left. Conservative government ministers and trans-exclusionary feminists make for surprising allies. But together, they wield huge political and cultural power. Their efforts recently put a stop to reform of the UK's gender recognition law, which had widespread public support. As more trans people decide to start families, their efforts are also made harder by this anti-trans minority, who amplify ever more emotive and inaccurate stories about pregnancy and parenthood. Julie McCandless studies the overlap of trans rights and parenthood in the UK. She says the law is deeply affected by biological essentialism, a theory that defines people according to their biological function above all else. Could you just explain what is meant by biological essentialism? It's this idea that if you're born with that particular sex body, um, you, you have a certain experience that others don't, don't share. And that may partly be true, but lots of people have varied experiences within that class of, 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 of women, of people. Biology is only meaningful because of the meanings that we, we give to it. Trans family rights are rarely on the agenda when it comes to campaigning for trans equality. And despite that, it's often transgender parents who are highlighted by journalists or mentioned by politicians in debates in ways that could be seen as provocative and whipping up lots of fear in the culture wars and that kind of thing. What is that about? <laughs> it's a bit like um, abortion in the US. Every politician has to have their position on that. There are lots of people who have maybe never met a trans person or a gay person. And, and then it's like this, this, this fear <laughs> becomes in their head that there's something that they are, they are not. Transphobia is having a real effect on the way trans people receive all kinds of health care in the UK. Pregnancy care is no exception. A report from the LGBT Foundation found that 30% of trans and non-binary people didn't access any NHS or private care during their pregnancy for fear of discrimination or mistreatment. In other words, no midwife, no scans, and no support while giving birth. I'm about to call someone who works within the NHS, um, who is keen to talk to us about what they perceive as a crisis, um, but who at the same time feels the need to remain anonymous. When it comes to this kind of research and the policy making, what's the general feeling towards that kind of work within the NHS? There's now an anxiety that is attached to doing anything in the LGBT space because that work has started to become being seen as controversial um, in a way that I think in the last, uh, previously it wasn't seen as such, it was seen as positive work, really important work. Now it's seen as something where there is a debate around it. Do you think that comes from within the NHS or is that from external sources? I think largely it's from external sources. I think we're seeing the effect of the culture war coming into our NHS in a very particular way. We've seen a lot of spaces where a piece of positive trans work is done and then an enormous amount of complaints or questions or FOIs are piled in en masse and that's become a particular tactic used by anti-trans groups to delay work. Wow, that's scary. The morale of LGBT staff is probably at an all-time low. There's an article every few weeks about how spending money on LGBT people is, is a waste. 
it doesn't take long before people start to be really affected by that. We asked the NHS to reply to these claims, but didn't get a response. Things would be so much easier for prospective trans parents with just a little more awareness. I wanted to speak to queer birth workers on the ground to understand how even the simplest of things, like a few words, can have a profound impact on trans parents. So I met up with AJ Silver and Ash Bainbridge at an LGBTQ centre in London. What have you encountered in terms of kind of having to get between birthing people and uh, healthcare staff in hospitals where it's something specifically related to someone's gender identity? More often than not, I have that conversation with service users beforehand. So like, yeah. at what point do you want me to mm -hmm. say something or to interject or to change the subject? Because obviously everyone's comfort level is very different. And some people are like, look, if I'm in labor and I'm being misgendered, I'm probably not even hearing it. So just let it go. Why does it matter at the most basic level of language that people see themselves talked about? Mm. It's so important, but I also think that inclusive language, we're now at the point where it's just being used to derail the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> and that we can't actually get to improving, like identifying and understanding why these health disparities exist because people are still, you know, counting the number of times the word woman appears versus the number of times pregnant person appears. Do you feel able to like bring your queerness to work? That's an interesting question. I do bring it to work. Mm -hmm. um, in some places, it is very welcome. In some places, less so. So I have my pronouns, for example, on my name badge, and I am happy to have that conversation with people if people are interested and ask questions. It's the fear of marginalisation, even if it doesn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. The number of times I've come out of a really great healthcare appointment and I've gone, Okay, nothing happened. <laughs> That's really good. And like that should not be the benchmark, <laughs> really. <laughs> yeah. This is something I say all the time when I do trainings or webinars or writing pieces about when people say, oh, we just train mid midwives because they're, you know, face to face with service right. users at that most critical moment. I'm like, no, 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 no. You can't just train or designate the care for trans and non binary or gender non conforming people to one element of that system. It needs to be wide. The work that Ash and AJ describe is often shouldered by junior NHS staff simply using their initiative. However, specialist providers like the Agora Clinic in Brighton are also starting to make fertility care more inclusive for trans families. We really have put a lot of attention into how we welcome people, how we make them feel absolutely safe, just so that you identify with something as soon as you walk in the clinic. Carol Gilling-Smith runs the Agora, a private fertility clinic that tailors a lot of their treatment programs to LGBTQ patients and aims to dispel myths around trans family planning. What are some of the concerns that you find people raise with you, maybe in an initial consultation, about their options for starting a family? Most of the patients I'm seeing are really at the beginning of their journey. And I think that's just a reflection on the fact that information about parenting when you're transitioning just isn't available. The real place for information giving is at the start of the journey and of course it's in the gender identity clinic uh, where sometimes that information isn't being given or isn't being given accurately and what I'm trying to do is to work with uh, both local and regional gender identity clinics Hello, Hello. Can, hi. hi there, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, OK. We were able to sit in on a consultation at the Agora Clinic with Amelia, a young trans woman, who discussed her recent decision to freeze her sperm at the clinic. So you came in four times, and there's 26 ampules, but it's how that might be used um, that we, we, we quite like to just sort of chat to you now about, because you're presumably now on hormone therapy, cross-hormone therapy. Yeah, yeah, probably about six months. So in terms of your future, that sperm is perfectly safe. It's going to be frozen by the NHS for 10 years. And then if you haven't thought about having a family at that point, you can extend the storage now for up to 55 years, which is perfectly safe, stored in liquid nitrogen, little little straws. They're about that, that, that tall, about that, that oh, thin. Okay. They're really tiny. So that's all stored and safe. For me, the, the, the really important things in, that I notice in consultation is the fear that 
trans folk have of talking to a doctor. They actually feel they're going to be judged before I've even started the conversation. So that the first thing I do is, look, this is going to be different to most of the consultations you've ever had because I'm here to help you preserve your fertility. Sadly, the legal reality of parenthood for trans people is not aligned with such inclusive care. There's a whole other sphere of information, which is the legal information, which we can't really, as medical experts, fertility experts, provide somebody coming to the clinic. In an ideal world, that would be sort of free, readily available, easy to access, but it isn't. Does that feel frustrating to you, that you are putting all this work into inclusive care, treating people as who they are, and then, for instance, a trans man comes in, gets treated by you respectfully, carries a baby, gives birth, and then has to register as the mother on the birth certificate? I feel that's incredibly unfair, and it does seem to me that the missing piece in that puzzle is providing legal advice and support from a much earlier stage. Despite hurdles at every turn, the resilience of trans people looking to start families is undeniable. How does it feel to be starting a family at this moment, in this climate? I guess to some extent a little bit scary with the way things seem to be turning against trans people, particularly with certain celebrities, very vocal. If you could say something to certain celebrities, what would it be just, you know, about your current situation? It's just like, talk to some trans people, meet them, learn. They're just real people, same as anyone else. We're no, we're no different, normal people living our lives. To know that there are people in trans communities and allies outside who are actively working to make it easier for trans people to become parents, however they wish, definitely makes me feel hopeful for the future. We're not taking up anyone else's space. We're just also existing. 